Hallelujah. Nothing greater than God's presence in the honor and worship of the Lord. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. God is good all the time, isn't he? Anybody going through anything? Don't raise your hands. You're supposed to. <laughs> hallelujah. If you're not going through something, see me after service. We'll get you to go through something. Psalm 23. <laughs> Psalm 23. Is everybody there? Verse 1, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. In other words, he's your head. He's your covering. It says, I shall not want, meaning you will not lack. When the Lord truly is your shepherd, you won't lack. And you know what? You know you're not going to lack. Because he's your shepherd. He's your guidance. He's your covering. He's your everything. Until that comes a reality, you'll still strive with God. And try and do your thing instead of his. He must become your true shepherd. You know, many, many people say, yeah, well, the Lord, uh, yeah, yeah, he's my Savior and my Lord. But for many people, he's still their Savior, even after 30 years of knowing the Lord. But he's not their Lord. Because when he's the Lord, he's the shepherd. And that's where you know no matter what's going on, it's going to work to the good. You don't have to do anything. You just have to wait. Amen. Trust, rest, and wait. So if the Lord is truly your shepherd, you won't lack nothing. In verse 2, it says, He makes me what? To lie down in where? Green pastures. In other words, He causes you <laughs> to be humble. He causes you to be what? Humble. Why? Because He's going to keep Himself as the head. Amen? Amen. It says, he leads you beside still waters. So he causes you to be humble, to lead you to the, his presence so that you thirst for the living water. He restores my soul. In other words, he's converting your soul. He's allowing, or you're allowing him, the continuous process of conversion of the soul. That means your mind, your will, your emotions, your imaginations, your desires, your heart, amen? There's a conversion there to be transformed into his likeness. The soul must be converted. It doesn't mean we live out of the soul. We live out of the spirit. But the soul must be converted in his image and likeness and character so that there's cooperation. Amen? It says that, he restores our, my, my soul, our soul. He leads us in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Oh, here we go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's called the valley of opportunity to change. Amen? I will not fear. I won't get carnal. I won't flesh out. I will know he's changing me. It's an opportunity to change if I cooperate. For you are with me, he says. Your rod and your staff, they shall come for me. Why? Because most of the time when you're in the valley, you can't see too well. When you're on your own, your, in your own garbage, your own puddle of afflictions, you can't see too well. But you know that he's going to guide you through. It's like a poke. When he leads the sheep, come on. Some of us need a, but sometimes it's a poke. Hallelujah. Not a jab, a poke. Amen? Hallelujah. He says, now, when you come through this, I'm going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And I'm going to give you more anointing. I'm going to, uh, you, uh, you, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Praise God. 
Surely goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord and his presence. Wow. So when you come out of the valley of opportunity to change, even though you can't see that staff pokes you, right? You come out of the valley with a fresh anointing and more desire of his presence because reality of his help and his need becomes an increase. There's more going, my gosh, I really need to have you, Lord. There's just no doubt about it. Amen? See, one of the things God is exposing right now is what I want to call unclean desires. These are hidden desires. These are things that you don't even know you have, yet you have them. Until they become evident. Until you're making a choice of something that you know you shouldn't. It's too late then, isn't it? But so God's trying to bring us through all of these things so that they can be removed. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6. Hidden, unclean desires. Now, in your own eyes, you may think that this desire is wonderful. But in the eyes of God, it's unclean. You may even consider it biblical. But in the eyes of God, it's unclean. In verse 14. Now let's start at 11. <laughs> Second Corinthians 6, 11. O Corinthians, O body of Christ, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own, what? Affections, desires, hidden, unclean, corrupt desires. You're restricted by them. Now, in return for some, I speak to you as children. In other words, they're preventing you from maturing. Do not be unevenly yoked with unbelievers. Okay, well, that's common sense. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion is light with darkness? How many know darkness is deception too? And what account accord has Christ with Belial? And what or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple with a what? An idol. You know what an idol is? An unclean desire. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell with them. I'll walk among them. I'll be their God. Those should be my people. If they do what? Come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. And don't touch what is what? Unclean. Unclean. And I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you. And you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hidden, unclean, corrupt desires that are of the flesh, that are either of the enemy, or they are from your past. These are false fulfillments. Not God's will or God's time. It is an unclean, and it carries corruptible seeds, preventing freedom, growth, and maturity. I'm going to say that again. What does it prevent? Freedom, growth, and maturity. And one of the other final things that it, pr it promotes is mistrust with God. And man. Amen? These are what we call areas of self-imposed afflictions when you cooperate with them. They bring what? Self-imposed afflictions. Many people think that they're suffering for Jesus. Many of them are suffering because they bring it on themselves. Self-imposed afflictions. Why? Because of the unclean, corrupt desires that are still in the heart, that are hidden and unseen, where God's bringing them through places and shaking, shaking, shaking until it comes to the surface. Is everybody okay? Second Corinthians, or Second Timothy 4. Second Timothy chapter four. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse one, let's speak it. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, 
be ready in season and out, convince, rebuke with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Wow. See, sound doctrine means it's not just the doctrine. It's submitting to the things of God. Wherever he's placed you, sent you, or what he's doing in the, as an assignment. See, people have itching ears. How is that itching ears? Because the enemy has planted an unclean desire from who knows when. And you're still trying to fulfill it. Not even knowing you're trying. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their what? Their what? Their what? Own desire. Come on, read it with me. Get that word and read it. Amen? Own desires. What are these desires? Hidden, corrupt, unclean. And where's the core of all desires? Your heart. Your heart. He said, so they're going to create their own, they're going to reason, they're going to create their own doctrine according to that desire and think it's okay. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. But you be watchful. Be what? Watchful in all things, meaning alert. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Now again, we're to be watchful, alert, seeing things through. Overcome all afflictions, sorrow, oppression, confusion, sickness, rejection. All soulish, foolish, hidden desires that can be activated. Amen? We're to overcome these things in the spirit. You can't overcome them in the flesh or in the soul. It will not work. Amen? Acts 9. Acts 9. So when it's exposed, don't get angry with God or other people. You need to thank God you got exposed. Why? So you can remove it. God will not remove it. That's your responsibility. He just assists in the exposure. Because he's the shaker. Verse 1, Acts 9, let's speak it. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And, he, and then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. God put him on a fast. Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And he said to him, Lord, in a vision, Ananias. And he said, yeah, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of a house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might what? Receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he is authority of the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must what? Suffer for my name's sake. So I want you to see something here. Saul, who became Paul, was on a mountaintop experience. He didn't know he was about to enter the valley of suffering. Why? Because that's where he changed. See, mountaintop experiences strengthen us. And it's valleys where you change. 
So Paul said, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? And God sent him on a journey. But he would have to go through many things to suffer. Now, Paul was going to suffer for Christ's sake, not for self's sake. There's a difference. There's a suffering and a self-imposed afflictions. And then there's a suffering where they're opposed by the enemy because you're doing the will of God. Amen? But people bring themselves into self afflictions because they're doing the will of self by hidden desires in the heart. Nobody okay. Mountaintop experience to many sufferings from the enemy, <laughs> not because of things for God. Does everybody understand that? So again, you're going to be attacked and suffering for the things of, of God because you're doing the things of God. The enemy's going to try to prevent you. Amen? But many people don't even realize they can blame, oh, this must be God. No, it's a self-imposed affliction you brought on yourself because your mouth or your, or your desire and your heart. Amen? So quit blaming God and blaming the devil. It's you that opened the door. 1 Peter 3. Glory. 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 13. That's why, the, you know, we keep hearing about the shaking, the shaking, the shaking. And God is shaking everything that can be shaken. And anything that is corrupt cannot be attached to us. It must be broke, severed, gone. Amen? First Peter chapter 3, verse 13, let's speak it. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is what? Good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats or the troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if, you, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing what? Evil. So in other words, there's the area where it's better to suffer for the will of God so that you can advance than for the will of self from hidden desires that cause delays and advancement until recognized and removed. Again, so that we never repeat it again. If there's repeating, then it's not been removed. It's not been dealt with. Go to verse 18. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins that the just... For, for, for the just, for the uh, unjust, that the, he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the what? In the spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Bapti baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Again, Jesus suffered for God's will to remove man's will of hidden desires that are unclean. In other words, he's making it available for me and you to access if we will. Many of these corruptible seeds that are implanted in the heart are from areas 
where we failed and then we want to make up for it. We want to do better for it. Or in areas to where something was spoken and we agreed with it. Anything to that degree that becomes a corruptible seed, even though it may seem good if it's not from God, it's corrupt. Does everybody understand this? And this is where you and I have to be careful. We need to have a guard over our hearts. But we need to get our hearts set free from all hidden corruptible desires. And if you're not willing to deal with it, you will only be limited to where you can grow. And we want to have the fullness of God. Amen? In other words, we got to come out of living out of the soul. We got to start living in the spirit and not in the flesh. We got to be God pleasers, not man pleasers. Matthew 17. In verse 1, is everybody there? Matthew 17, 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like a sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said, answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make it. Here are three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I would say that they all had a mountaintop experience. Amen? While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, here was a mountaintop experience, amen? Or what we might call revelation. And what does it do? It's for strengthening and encouragement. It is in the valley where opportunity to change comes by sufferings of exposure of the unclean, hidden desires. They must be exposed. Is everybody okay? Now, in this, you got to remember, look at, um, there are things that we don't know until we attempt to fulfill. All of a sudden, it comes up. It comes up. Now, there are things going to come up so that you agree with it so it can be re to the things that you took out. That have been removed. That's why it's so important to be careful of who you associate with. It's amazing how many times when people get their cell phones back, they begin to call people bad. Already to put, put in incorruptible seed, not even knowing it. Well, I wonder how much his name is doing. Well, who told you that? Jesus? Self? Enemy? What's, the, what's its purpose? And remember, the enemy is trying to bring in what? Depart, corruptible, unclean desires. That's what's going on all over the world right now, isn't it? Look at how many people are afraid, bound by fear, bound by medications. There isn't too many people running to the throne to run into the phone, amen? And to run into the physicians, the pharmacies, the drugs, all kinds of stuff instead of running to the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, in this, we have to be careful. Knowing the attacks, either from a self-imposed, amen, because of the self-imposed affliction, a desire, or it's coming from the enemy because you're doing the will of God. Now, everybody hear this. Your tongue will determine the condition of your heart. And your tongue will determine your delay or advancement. All glories come out of the hand of hard times, I'm sorry. All glories come out of hard times. 
That's how it happens. You don't get uh, wine unless you squeeze grapes, right? You don't get olive oil unless you squeeze an olive. You don't get a diamond unless the coal is squeezed. Every unclean desire must be brought to the slaughter or it will repeat itself and delay advancement. Everyone wants to jump from mountaintop to mountaintop. Amen? Nobody wants to go in the valley and change. I mean, just psh, wait for the next mountaintop. It doesn't work. But it is the valley where the, the Lord searches out the heart. So we can cooperate with the exchange of that. In Matthew 16, in verse 13. Verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? In other words, who am I to you? When there's a true, close relationship, the heart is clean from all hidden unclean, corrupt desires. It's gone. The closer you get to him, the cleaner you get. Because you can't get close to him without being clean. The further you, many people think they have a close relationship with the Lord, but it's distant. If you're still repeating the same thing, there's something wrong. Amen? Let's go a little further. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bird, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Did Peter have a revelation? Amen. He had a mountaintop experience. Amen. And what's the revelation do? It brings what? Strength. Brings encouragement. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, weapons. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he commanded them, his disciples, that they should not tell no one that he was the Christ, Jesus the Christ. And from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. From the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And be killed and be raised the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Saying, far be it that you would, Lord, this, this happened to you. This shall not happen to you. Nobody's going to get to you except for through me, in other words. And Jesus turned around and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. I love it. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God. But the things of what? Men, here Peter had this mountaintop experience, revelation. Yes, you're the Lord, man. You're the anointed one. Praise God, I'll follow you all the way until I die. Oh, man, nobody's going to touch you. Oh, you fleshly thing. Anybody going to get to you, they got to get to me. Oh, that hidden desire of pride came bursting up. I'm going to protect God. Nice. <laughs> no, that's not how. Peter, mountaintop revelation he got strengthened he got encouraged but pride blinded the plan of god what blinded the plan of god pride and the lord said get behind me what satan you're an offense to me peter fell into the valley with unclean desire and got rebuked by jesus because he allowed the devil to use that desire wrongfully amen Matthew 13. Hallelujah. Matthew 13. Verse 18. Matthew 13, 18. Let's speak it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, he does not understand it. Then a wicked one comes 
snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Now the seed of God is a good desire, isn't it? It's a righteous desire. It's a holy desire. The enemy will come in and take it if it's not protected. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, that is, he, he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he what? He stumbles. No root. For he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world. How are the cares of this world? Cares are desires, aren't they? Amen. So that means there's an unclean, corruptive desire that must be removed. If it's not removed, what's going to happen? And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes what? Unfruitful. In other words, no advancement. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word of God and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and produces some sixty, uh, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Unclean desires. Well, uh, our man, they allow the dethroning of the will of God. Every time, they dethrone the will of God. See, you cannot, because what happens when an individual comes into a place of the valley? The first thing they look to is themselves. And they try to reason. I'm a good person. I haven't done anything wrong. Wrong. The eyes are in the wrong place. They should be on him, not self. He is the only one that can lead us through. He will expose everything that needs to be exposed. And if you're willing to cooperate, you'll cooperate and remove it. And destroy it. Dethrone it and slaughter it. So it never comes back again. But if you repeat it, that means either after you slaughter it and kill it, it means you agreed with it that was brought back by the enemy and offered it to you. In exchange for the will of self and giving up the will of God. Is everybody all right? Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 24. What does it say? Therefore what? Whoever hears these sayings of mine, hello, and does them, I will liken him to be a wise person who has built his house on the anointing. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the what? On the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And a rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was his fall. See, this is where people compromise or reason. Well, I'm no longer using drugs or alcohol anymore. I'm clean. I'm no longer using fornication. But I'm still chasing those things that I'm not supposed to. I'm still looking at those things. I still have that desire that's unclean, that desire that will exchange the will of God for the will of man. Remember, these unclean desires are called lust. They're not love. That means living under what? Satanic torment. Amen? And people try to reason. The enemy will bring so much reasoning, it's incredible. He'll bring so much justification to it, it's incredible. But see, God sees through all of it. And he's trying to find out how truly genuine we are. People get themselves in so much emotional entanglements with idols. An idol can be a, anything, anyone. Hallelujah. Is everybody okay? Let's go a little further. Uh, did we start yet? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to uh, Matthew 7, verse 
18, a good tree cannot bear what? Bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear what? Good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you're going to know them. By their what? Desires. Desires. Their desires. Their choices. You're going to know them. Amen? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, look at this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I've prophesied in your name. I did, I did all the things. Cast out devils in your name and all many things and wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. Why? Unclean, corruptible desires. And again, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, praise God, it's going to do them. Amen. It's, it's so vitally important to understand the things that are happening right now. Because no matter where you look, the enemy's trying to place desires. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Fear, anxiety, stress, all of these things. Emotional entanglements. You know, my wife married me the first time for good intentions. I mean, we loved each other, we thought. But she thought I, I was, that, that I had good potential. Even when I was running dope and all the other stuff, she still thought I had good potential. Maybe as a salesman, I don't know. She thought I was a good person, but I was just entangled in all of the stuff. And of course, the marriage didn't last long. <laughs> Eight years in divorce, three years. It wasn't until Jesus came, and when he removed all of those from me, because I cried out for almost two years, help, help, help. I didn't, you get to a point where I'm either going to die or something's got to change. But when he showed up in his love, penetrated every part of my being, and every one of those corruptible desires of my heart was removed. Even when I had my mountaintop experience, I still had to go through sufferings to remove everything that he didn't. And he didn't remove everything. I kept asking him, why? Come on, man, we had this wonderful opportunity. To totally clean me out, man. Why'd you still leave these here? Why do I still have to get rid of them? Because that's a part of your suffering. I'm going to train you through these things. I'm going to exchange these things so that my image and likeness and character begin to overtake every area. And you're going to want to exchange those things because you want to be more like me. And it still happens. See, you don't even realize when you pick up something. But you must exchange it every day. I was speaking to someone the other day, and I told him, yeah, I suffer emotional attachments with my wife and my children and everything. Every day. He goes, every day? I said, yeah, every day. Why? Because I don't want to have access. I see too many people get so entangled by emotion. It is disgusting. Living it out of the soul instead of out of the spirit. Living out of the carnal mind instead of out of the spirit. And they fall into traps all the time. And when they go in the valley, they blame everybody else. Instead of taking personal responsibility. And maybe cutting loose, destroying and slaughtering those things and moving on. Amen. But hallelujah. Nobody escapes it. Everybody Gets a, a mountaintop experience, refreshing, revelation. Yes, wonderful. Everybody wants to live there. Who doesn't? Praise God. Get your slide and go into the valley. Because it's coming. Now, let me tell you this. When you go into the valley and you cooperate with God and don't reason, grumble, complain, or whatever, and keep your mouth shut, the next mountaintop experience will last longer. You have a longer run. Yes. 
So I encourage you when you get in there, die. And shut up. But, but, you remember what happened? Listen, here's Adam and Eve have mountaintop experience, amen? Come on, they lived in the presence of the glory of God. And then when they got deceived, what happened? Adam blamed his wife. She blamed the serpent. And they all got thrown out of the garden. Into the land of suffering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Luke 14. Luke 14, 25. Now great multitudes went with Jesus and he turned. So you can imagine, there's all these multitudes are following Jesus and he stops and turns around. And he says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and his own life, also cannot be my disciple. Whoa! Hate your life. So many people are fighting for their lives and their wants and their desires instead of fighting for the life of Christ. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish, lest after he has laid the foundation, hello, after the foundation has been laid, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to what? Mock. Saying this person began to build and was not able to what? Finish. That doesn't leave you a good reputation, does it? It's an unstable reputation. It's a double-minded reputation. It's an untrusting reputation. Amen? Unless we are willing to forsake all unclean desires, which is lust, and put Jesus first in every decision, desire, and direction, you cannot be converted in his image. You just can't. Won't. Does everybody understand? That means that's a conversion of the soul. In Hebrews 10. See, many don't realize that they're beginning to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead of eating from the tree of what? Life. Because when your eyes are on you, you're eating from good and evil. Good comes and evil follows. It will be a good seed, but it will be an evil seed. It's not a righteous seed. It's not a righteous desire. It's a good desire with a following of an evil one. It comes in disguise. It's camouflage. Once it enters, it's there unless it's slaughtered. You and I should have not good desires. They should be righteous ones. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse uh, 32. Does everybody understand this, what's happening today? I'm telling you, this is vitally important. Many people are going to fall into the traps and don't realize it. In verse 32, but recall the what? The former days in which you were illuminated. With a revelation, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my change and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better <laughs> and enduring possession for yourselves. Where? In heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence or your trust in the Lord, which has what? Great reward. For you have need of what? Endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Do you think that the will of God is to remove every unclean, corruptible, hidden desire? Yes. How about cooperation with it? Yeah. So this is that you may receive the promise or advancement. For yet a little while, he, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. 
Now the just live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back to perdition, but to, of those who believe in the saving of the soul. You are in need of endurance to turn from the will of self to the will of God so that you may advance into the promises of God. In Psalm 39, In Psalm 39, in verse 1, is everybody there? Good. Let's all speak this together. I said, I will what? Guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. <laughs> yes. While the wicked are before me, I was mute with silence, and I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. You know, I have this niffle and binky. You know what a baby's binky is? I got a niffle and one. It's about yay big. It hangs in my office on the wall. When people just shoot off at the mouth uncontrollably, they won the binky award. We would put it around her neck, and anybody who walked by them could squeeze it. <laughs> Don't win the Binky Award. <laughs> that person had to wear the Binky Award for a day. And anybody had an opportunity to go around and squeeze it. It's still hanging in my office, ready for the next victim. <laughs> Verse 4. <laughs> Hallelujah. We had this one guy, he wanted, oh, he just wouldn't shut up no matter what. Brought him in my office, he still wouldn't shut up. I took that thing off the wall and I said, where are this? He's an ex-biker type of dude. I didn't give a hoot. He wore it. I said, either wear it or get out of here. He wore it. I said, you willing to do whatever it takes? Everybody an opportunity to go, wait, wait. You know what happened? He shut up. He learned. Got to hang it on the wall. He never put it on again. Haven't had to give it to anyone else since. Don't be the next one. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go back to verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end. Don't make me wear that binky. And what is the measure of my days? That I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my ages as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but a what? A vapor. Surely, every man walks about like a shadow. Surely, they busy themselves in vain. Oh, that's an elder teaching. Vanity. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is what? In you. Deliver me from all of my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you made his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is vapor. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gaze from me, that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. Wow, what was he saying? Restrain my mouth from evil of the unclean hidden desires. In other words, I need to repent. Turn from those things so that the refreshing of the Lord can come. Amen? Now I'm going to close at 1 Peter 1. Rejoice. The Bible says rejoice when you get exposed. <laughs> Thank God. 1 Pete 1 verse 3. Let's speak it. 
Blessed be the God and the Father. Is everybody there? Oh. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by the valley. Yeah, various trials. That the what? Genuineness, genuineness of your relationship, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressibly and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, this is all a test of genuineness of the heart. Again, good, good intentions are not sufficient. It's not about good intentions, it's about righteous intentions. Everything that we see good must be exchanged with righteous. Well, that's good. No, because if it's not righteous, it ain't dead. There's the tree of good and evil, and there's a the tree of life, which is righteousness. Peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Good intentions, not always God's will, is it? Amen? Be careful. Be careful. We've been warned already. It's happening. The enemy's on the run. And he's looking for any open door he can. Because these demons need to get fed. And they love to get fed by emotion. Amen? Is anger an emotion? Amen. Is fear an emotion? How about lust? Yeah, those are all emotions. Stop feeding them. Starve the enemy and feed your spirit, man, with truth of righteousness and walk away from the things that we call good oh it's good does everybody understand that it's got to be righteous that's better than good isn't it amen thank you father for your word we are honored and blessed lord we ask for your mercy's grace and help we ask for the anointing that we can endure all things and lord as you continue to expose our hidden desires of corruption Help us to slaughter every single one of them. That we may be free from ourselves and the entanglements and our, the affairs of this world in our past, trying to bring false fulfillments in our life. That we may fulfill your will, your desire, and receive the promises that you have for us as we complete every assignment according to your will and not ours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Prepare your hearts for communion. And you may bring up any tithes.